So we're going to start. Uh, I'm just going to say that it's Monday, July 16, 2018, and I'm in the home of Walter Nagel doing an interview for the Stonewall Oral History Project. Thank you, Walter. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. So oral histories usually start at the beginning of a person's life. So can you tell me where and when you were born and something about how you grew up? Mm -hmm. Well, I was born on October 9th, 1949 in Morristown, New Jersey, uh, the county seat, I guess, of, Mar of Morris County. Um, and not long after I was born, several months after I was born, we moved to a small, smaller town, rural, more rural, called Sakasana. Uh, probably, I don't know, maybe 18 miles from Morristown. Uh, it was very uh, quiet, rural, lots of farmland then when I was growing up, um, all white community. Um, I was raised as a Roman Catholic and, uh, you know, went to elementary high school in that town, Roxbury Township, which encompasses several towns. Um, yeah, that's pretty much the basic basic stuff. So, can you tell me a little bit more? What was your family like, and how do you remember yourself? Mm -hmm. Well, I came from a, a large family. We were Roman Catholic, as I said, and my mother had nine pregnancies, uh, seven of which survived. I was next to the youngest. Uh, mostly, there were, you know, roughly two years or so between all of us, except when it came to me, there was another child born after me who did not live, and so there's about five years between me and the youngest, my younger sister. Um, my, both of my parents were professional people. My mother was a registered nurse. My father was a teacher who taught um, mostly when I was growing up, taught mostly in New York State schools because the salary here was better. So, you know, he had a long commute every day, a little more than an hour, hour and a half, roughly, every day. So. Um, it was, uh, there were a lot of us, and <laughs> being one of the youngest, I did get a lot of attention. I was taken care of by, uh, usually by my older sisters when my mother wasn't there. Um, and it was sort of a, I guess you could say, a rough and tumble existence. We had, all had our own interests. Uh, my older brothers were very into athletics, my older sisters, a variety of different things. Um, it was a small community. Everybody knew everybody else. And uh, I realized as I get older, it was probably more conservative than I imagined. I mean, I grew up in a fairly liberal family, and I think most of my friends did the same. But uh, when I go back there now, I kind of realized that I think it was a little more conservative than when I was, than when I was growing up or that I was aware of. And how do you remember yourself when you think of what kind of kid you were and how you felt about yourself? Yeah. Well, I, th I think of myself as kind of shy. Um, I was pretty smart, you know. I was always in what, in those days, as we're talking about the 1950s now, at least in that community, they kind of tracked kids. So a lot of our uh, placements in school were based on what I guess were known as the Iowa tests. They were intelligent IQ tests or whatever. And I usually scored pretty highly on those. So I, one of the nice things about tracking was that kind of the same group of, small group of kids kind of went through school together, really bonding more than if we were kind of moving from a different class to class every year. So. Um, in that way, it was kind of nice. I mean, I developed friendships that I still have, you know, 60-some-odd 60, 60 years later. Um, and as I said, I was kind of shy. Uh, I was talented in, I would say that I was talented in the arts, particularly in music and visual arts. And I, I spent a lot of time reading. Um, the friendships I had were mostly people at school. There was really nobody in right near my house that I hung out with a lot. Um, so I did spend a lot of time by myself as a child. Uh, we had a woods in our, in our, behind our house and I spent a lot of time out there, you know, exploring and reading and doing things out there by myself. Um, and, you know, growing up in a big family like that, I think 
time alone and solitude and uh, privacy is something that you kind of treasure because you don't have a lot of it. So uh, I would say that that was basically who I was at the time. Mm -hmm. And do you remember when you were first interested in voice? Uh, yeah, sure, I think. I mean, I'm uh, interested in boys. Like sexually interested? Sexually curious about, like I would rather see a boy naked than I would rather see a girl naked? Well, Probably. Or you think about, like, <laughs> like when, like was there a time or an, or an evolution where you thought to yourself, oh, my interests sort of beyond friendship are in boys so, um, and that that's different from some of the kids around me do you do you remember how that kind of evolved or was it well I, I think I was aware of an interest or an attraction to a physical attraction to boys probably uh, fourth or fifth grade um, it didn't really manifest itself uh, until really, uh, I, I, I didn't behave sexually until I was well out of high school. Um, but there was a curiosity and I developed, you know, I had friendships, close, I would say close friendships with girls and with boys. Uh, but probably in high school, probably more with, with a couple of girls that I was close to. And you know, still am. One of them has died, but I'm still fairly close to the other. Uh, the boys I hung around with uh, were bandmates. I was a uh, sort of in a rock band when I was in high school. So, you know, we spent time together because we had to rehearse, we had dates, we had to perform, that kind of thing. But in terms of, like, my best, if I was to say my best friend in high school, it would have been one of the girls. And did you feel there was anything about you you needed to hide, or were you comfortable in who you were and how you fit into the world? And um, I don't, I don't think of my, I don't think there was anything I needed to hide. Um, I wasn't necessarily comfortable in the world, but it wasn't necessarily because of my sexual orientation. Uh, you know, those those were things that we just didn't. We didn't really talk about that, either at home or in school. I think people just kind of assumed that you're going to take a certain path. Um, a lot of, you know, of course, my friends, well, my friends, the other boys in my class, at some point started dating and started dating girls, and I had girlfriends that I would go to a movie with or go to a dance with or something. But there was not any kind of serious um, physical involvement with any girl. Um, and certainly not with any guy. I mean, just, um, you know, being gay, or at that time being homosexual, was just taboo. It was not uh, something, like I said, it was not something even discussed, let alone thought about being. And the very limited exposure I had to ideas about homosexuality, mostly, and not completely, but mostly were, of course, very negative, and not something I could identify with. Uh, the first, I think the first article I remember seeing in print, um, I believe it was Look Magazine, and it was all about, it was all about the leather world and the leather and the world of uh, people who, well, we m maybe were transsexual, but there were there were men that quote unquote wanted to be women or something, which of course is the way straight people thought about gay men <laughs> across the board. It's like you know, I think at that time, and I just couldn't you know I was this kind of young clean cut kid, I wasn't into bars, I wasn't into drinking, I wasn't into leather, I was, you know, I was into folk music and sunshine and positive <laughs> experiences. Uh, and, 
so I just, you know, it's like, well, that's not me. That's, that's something I can relate to. Um, so I didn't really start feeling... I did see... <clears throat> the other thing that went on at that time, what is now known as, like, talk shows, as you will, if you, if you will, there were a few that were on television during those days. Um, you know, you had sort of mainstream people like Mike Douglas and um, Merv Griffin, and of course Johnny Carson was on late at night. But then there were other people. There was a fellow named Joe Pine and somebody else named Alan Burke. They were kind of local New York people. And they, they, they would have like all kinds of, you know, kind of across the board people on. You know, from fairly straight mainstream people, but to like really outrageous guests, um, you know, people who would said they were kidnapped by space aliens, things like that. I mean, really far out stuff. But then they would also have people on who they considered to be far out. And there were probably people from the Madagene Society who would show up. I think I have maybe some tapes of some people that were, were on. There was one, I think there, there was one fellow on, maybe from the Madagene, who was, you know, talking about homosexuality in a very, like, you know, this is natural. This is perfectly, you know, it happens all over the world. And, you know, and we're not all leather people or this people or that people. You know, he's sitting there in a, probably a suit and a tie at the time. Um, and the other person that inf I would say, and I think she was on David Susskind. David Susskind was sort of middle, middle of, the, of the extremes. He had some some pretty, I would say, radical or unusual people on. Byard was one of them who would show up periodically. But there was a woman named Mary Steichen Calderon, who actually was the daughter of the very famous photographer Edward Steichen. And she was Quaker, a member of, I guess, the New York Yearly Meeting, where I work. And she founded something called SECUS, which is still around, Sex Information and Educational Council of the US, I think, still around. Um, and it was just, you know, for common sense, uh, scientifically based knowledge in, in sex education. And she was on, and she just spoke very straightforwardly and very honestly and perfectly sensibly about sexuality in general and specifically same-sex relationships. And it was like, this is, this is fine. I mean, this is natural. This is, uh, I, I, I don't like to use the word normal because I think it has lots of other implications, but it's certainly natural. It's part of the human condition. Um, on the continuum of sexuality, there isn't just like a straight and a gay. There's a whole continuum of sexuality. And, uh, you know, it was just very, it was kind of a revelation to me and very, I think, liberating in a way. So I started, you know, I started to feel more comfortable when I listened when to people like that. When was that, more or less? Probably 1966, I would say. I, gra I was graduated in 1967, so I would say roughly, you know, my last couple of years of high school I was seeing these programs, so it was probably 65, 66. And how aware were you of what was going on um, kind of politically in the, the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement and how much did you, were you paying attention to the outside world as a teenager? Oh, I was very aware of that. Um, I was very interested in the African-American struggle. Um, I kind of latched on to the, you know, being kind of a religious kid and being a Catholic. I kind of latched on to the idea of um, nonviolence, responding to violence with love or an attempt at loving and understanding and reconciliation and healing. I found that very appealing. Um, you know, may, I may have also found it appealing because I wasn't a rough kid, I wasn't a bully, I wasn't you know, a muscular type. But at the same time, I mean, I was raised, I was raised to be a compassionate and sensitive and understanding kid. And so when I saw people in the African-American community responding to oppression and to violence nonviolently, I found that very appealing. 
And so, I, you know, we, we got the New York Times. We didn't necessarily get it every day, but we certainly got it on the weekends. And I was always reading about the struggle. Um, and Bayard Weston's name was some a name that came up very frequently in those articles. Uh, and he was really the person that... Um, he was the one that talked about nonviolence, and he was the one that talked about strategies, and he was the one that kind of made sense to me in terms of taking a philosophy and, you know, this is how we do it. So I was exposed to Bayard really through my interest in the civil rights movement. Uh, the larger world of the Vietnam War, of course, was going on. I was very concerned about that. I thought it was an unjust war. Uh, the people that I admired, uh, it, including Bayard, who was an active in both movements, uh, but people in the, in the folk music world were very anti-war. And so, you know, I, I it, it resonated very clearly with me. So, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't a gay rights movement the way we think of it now, really, until Stonewall. I mean, there were small groups of people, but unless you were really in urban areas or you really kind of did your homework, I guess, um, you wouldn't necessarily even know about those. So uh, th my interest in the larger world was mostly in terms of American domestic civil rights issues and, you know, international affairs. So I, was very, I think I was very aware. Yeah. And was that, um, how did that fit into your family and your community? He said he lived in, a, in an all-white area. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, it's... Well, certainly, like, everybody in my family is reasonably intelligent. Uh, but, you know, to the, degree, to the degree that we're interested in these kinds of subjects, it, it varies. I think of all the kids in the family, I was probably the most interested. I was certainly the most interested in the civil rights movement um, and probably the most interested in international affairs, uh, certainly at that time and I think even now. Um, but it wasn't something, it wasn't something we sat at, we didn't sit around the dinner table and talk about those things. We sat around and talked about how our day went or, you know, what activities we were involved in at school, that kind of thing. Um, and in the larger, I would say the larger, it was true in the larger community too. The only kinds of discussions I would have on those issues maybe were in history class in school. Um, a few of my teachers were fairly uh, interested or, I mean, interested outside of just the realm of teaching. You know, they had they had their own opinions about things. It wasn't all necessarily stuff that was in the textbook. You know, so we could have some conversations about that. But it wasn't, it wasn't something I talked about a lot with people, um, just because the opportunities really didn't present themselves. Uh, when I was a senior, we had, we had a black student, two black students in my high school, sisters, one of whom was in my graduating class. And the other one, I think, was two years younger, two or three years younger. And, um, you know, they came into the school and, f as far as I could see, for the most part, were accepted and were welcomed. And if there was anybody that had a problem with it, they just, maybe they didn't dare to say anything or, you know. So what happened when you graduated from high school? What did you do? Well, I started, uh, I spent a year at the University of Bridgeport in Connecticut. Uh, as a journalism major. I was interested in being a writer or being a journalist and they had a fairly good journalism program. So I started in September of 1967 and went there. Um, made a couple of close friends, uh, people, you know, liberal, liberal left types. Um, but again, I didn't have a wide circle of friends. Uh, I, I think I, I found my first year of college a little bit intimidating academically. Uh, I wasn't the star that I was in high school. Uh, but also I had these, it was a very tumultuous year politically and um, 
court, I had to register for the draft. So, you know, there were a lot, there were a lot of things going on. And over the course of the year, I kind of felt that this, I shouldn't be here. I should be out doing something publicly. So I guess during my second semester, I decided I was, you know, I would stick out the year, but I was going to not come back. So I left in uh, May, early June of 68. I left school. And of course, by that time, you know, you had the two assassinations uh, going into the summer where the Democrat, you know, the Democratic met. So uh, while I was in my second semester, I had decided to apply to VISTA. I had met somebody at school who was a former VISTA volunteer. And we had talked, and I decided I was going to apply. So I applied and didn't know until the end of the summer. But I had, you know, kind of made up my mind that I wasn't going to go back to school. So I, I expected to get into VISTA. Uh, and I did. So uh, I guess at the end of August, early September, I went out to Chicago. And I was working, I was trained um, with a group of volunteers who were, after, I guess, maybe three weeks or a month of training were kind of dispersed in the Midwest area. I stayed in Chicago and I was working for Hull House, uh, one of the, I guess one of the first, if not the first settlement, what they call settlement houses in the U.S. And I was working, you know, it was a rather, I guess you could say safe, uh, not very controversial uh, program working with senior citizens on the near south side. And that's where I was for the year. So that was 68 into 69. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, were you still Catholic, a practicing Catholic? No. I had pretty much, actually during that first year of college, uh, I, was, I was going to Mass on Sundays. But during the course of that year, I went to my hometown priest, there were a couple, but I went to the one that I guess I felt the most comfortable with because I wanted to discuss my feelings vis-a-vis -vis the draft and vis-a-vis -vis war and peace and issues like that. And I, you know, I told him how I felt. Um, I had registered, but I told him how I felt and I said, you know, I don't think I could do this. I don't want to do it. I think it's wrong. And he said, no, that it was my duty to do it. And, you know, the communists were godless. And so you had to go after them and kill them, basically. So that was like kind of the final nail in the coffin, I guess, as far as my Catholicism was concerned. I wasn't, you know, by that time I felt, you know, you know, you're born with brown hair, you're born with white skin, you're born being gay, you're born, you're not necessarily born in a particular religion. Religion is a matter of choice. So it's like, you know, I can leave that and and search if I if I feel the need for a spiritual home or something like that I can search around for one. So I I, I pretty much stopped going to the church and, and charted my own path, I guess you could say. And did that how did that feel when you put the church aside? What was that like for you? Uh, I to be honest, I don't think I felt very much of anything. Um, you know, I think my mother was disappointed, but not so disappointed that she felt the need to talk me into staying or doing anything like that. Uh, you know, I respected their right to believe how they did, and I wasn't trying to convince them of my way, and, you know, they weren't really trying to convince me of their way. My, my parents were not very religious. I mean, they were observant, and my mother was active in the church, but not, um, they weren't zealots say that. So I can't say that I really felt um, a, a tremendous sense of loss or a tremendous sense of alienation or rejection by anybody in my family because I chose to leave. And do you remember um, when Stonewall happened? I think I remember reading about it in the Chicago papers. Um, yeah, that's pretty much what I remember. Yeah. And at that point, were you 
in love with men was Oh yeah, actually actually during that year in Chicago I I had my first sexual experience. Uh, and I guess my second sexual experience were my I had two partners over the course of that, that year. Um, and I was, uh, you know, I was young, well, young, I'm not that young, I was 19. Um, and of course, you know, the first experience felt like I was in quote unquote love. Um, and, you know, part of my upbringing and part of my Catholicism, I think, you know, you, you keep that stuff with you no matter what, kind of. It may be buried in there somewhere, but it's still there. Well, you know, you can't, you know, sex and love are this, are tied, you know, the same thing, or, you know. So you can't have sex without love. I guess you could have love without sex, but, you know, if, if you're going to have engage in sex, love has to be involved some way. So, uh, you know, I was kind of struggling a little bit with those feelings, but, uh, you know, I learned pretty much pretty quickly that, you know, the two things were, it was great when they were together, but they didn't, they didn't always have to be. And so do you remember at that time, like, how you felt about yourself? Or did you feel like it was okay you, that you were finding that you were loving men, or did it feel like something that wasn't okay? Like, how did you process it for yourself? I felt, I felt okay about it. Um, when I first, I remember when I first felt that I was homosexual, which was before I actually had any sex with anybody, I can't, I, and this was, of course, when I was still in the church, I felt like, oh, you know, okay, if I'm going to be homosexual, that's okay, but I have to be celibate. I can't have sex with anybody. I can't have sex, period. Well, I got over that pretty quickly. And um, after that initial experience, which was actually a very loving experience, it didn't result in a long-term relationship, but it was with somebody who was very kind and generous and loving and, you know, we remained in touch for quite a while. Um, it was kind of like, you know, I, I felt I felt good about it and I felt comfortable and I didn't have any sense of guilt or any, um, you know, any sense that I was doing anything wrong. Good. And were you mm. open or did you feel like you nonetheless needed to keep it to yourself? I wouldn't say that I was open in the way we, I guess maybe the way we talk about openness now. Um, it's, it's interesting, in some ways I was kind of like, well, no, not, not, not as open as Bard was, even though people, some people say he wasn't. Um, I mean, you know, it just, it didn't present itself as an issue. Um, I wasn't dating any, I wasn't dating anybody really, male or female. I wasn't going out and socializing with groups of people. I was still pretty much a loner. Um, so, but you know, I didn't walk into my job and say, hey, I'm homosexual. I mean, I think that, that, that might have re resulted in my termination, uh, perhaps. Uh, but it, at the same, well, you know, I didn't, well, it never got to the point in in terms of relation to my draft status where I had to declare myself because I had declared myself as a conscientious objector, and even though I wasn't granted that status um, officially, uh, I never got to the point where I had to go and be uh, interviewed or examined by a military, you know. And if I had, and he had asked me, I would have said yes. You know, and they would, of course, assume that I was lying or making it up to avoid going to the service, but I wouldn't have been. I was, I was open, yeah. My mom, um, we never really talked about it openly, but um, at that time. But I think, you know, I think she pretty much knew, yeah. So what happened after that year in Chicago? Where did you go? 
Well, I went back home for a few weeks, and then I uh, decided I had an older brother in California who had lived there for, at that point, probably eight or nine years. And, you know, California has, was kind of this, like, beacon of uh, freedom and liberation and sunshine and all of those wonderful things, at least we thought so at the time, uh, especially for gay men. And so, you know, I decided I was going to hitchhike across the country. So I did. I stuck out my thumb and, you know, got rides all the way across the, across the country. I, I did uh, take a detour for a couple of a week or two in Minnesota where I had a sister living and her family stayed with them there. Uh, and then went on, uh, on to San Francisco and... Well, the Bay Area. My brother didn't live in San Francisco proper. He lived in a suburb, and I stayed with him uh, for really about two months. Came back east at the end of November, lived at home for another month or so, and then moved to New York in January of 1970. And so in that period, were you involved in um, anything kind of in the early, what we now look at as kind of the early gay rights movement? like the Gay Liberation Front, or the Gay Activist Alliance, or even the Mattachine Society? No, not, no not until I came to New York. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I wasn't doing anything like that. I mean, yeah, I just wasn't. I mean, the opportunity, I don't even think, presented itself where I was living. You know, if I had been living in San Francisco proper, it would have been different, or in New York, but I was living in these small suburban towns and yeah, I don't think the movement had really spread much beyond the urban areas at that point. So what was it like to come to New York? Oh, it was great. It was uh, wonderful, liberating. Um, you know, I had come here off and on as a child. I had relatives here, and I would visit and would, you know, go to museums and do theater and things like that. New York was kind of a place where a lot of the things that I was interested in, the visual arts, the musical arts, you know, this is kind of where it was all happening. Um, so, you know, it was nice to get out of that small town and come here. And I felt that, um, again, coming, having come from a large family, it was like, I'm on my own now, I have my own life, I, have my, I can have my own apartment. Uh, you know, all of the kinds of freedoms that you don't necessarily have when you're living with eight other people. Um, so yeah, I felt, uh, I felt very much at home right from the get-go here. Where did you live when you moved here? Well, when I, first, I, I do have a sister here who lives here, an older sister. Um, who is in uh, you know, the psychiatric field, let's say. Her, she was married to a psychiatrist. She herself is a, a PhD in um, nursing, psychology, you know. Um, and I was living with them for a few months to save money so that I could get my own apartment. And actually, you know, I was, I was there very interested in psychology and psychiatry at the time. So, and, you know, I thought about going back to school and majoring in that. So I decided I, I was able to get a job at one of the New York State psychiatric hospitals here. So once I had that job for a few months, I was able to save up enough money so that I was able to get a small apartment up in uh, East Harlem, 122nd Street off of 3rd Avenue. And, you know, it was a very small uh, kind of, well, maybe one and a half rooms with a bathroom, uh, but it was mine, you know, and I decorated it the way I wanted to decorate it, and it was my own space, and it, it, was, it was just kind of nice to feel that. Um, yeah, and, you know, it wasn't, it, I wouldn't say that it was close to where I worked, but it was close enough so I was able to just hop on the bus and, and get up to the Psychiatric Institute at 168th Street pretty quickly. And were you still making music? I wasn't making music at that time, no, I wasn't. Um, I decided to go to photography school. There were a couple of trade schools at the time in New York. Um, and so I decided to go at night to a school which was located way down in the financial district. Uh, 
at night. I guess it was, you know, three times a week usually. So I was working at PI during a psychiatric institute during the day and going to photography school at night. So, so music was pretty much. I mean, I I was a good. I was a listener. Uh, I was a consumer, but I wasn't performing or anything. But still in the arts, just in a different. Oh yeah, way. definitely. Yeah, very much so. Mm -hmm. And were you um, at that point getting involved in in the gay rights movement? Yeah, a little bit. Not a lot, but a little bit. Um, I participated in a couple of like early marches, and I don't mean well. I should say demonstrations, not marches. I don't mean like uh, you know Gay Pride Day marches. I'm talking about uh, up going up to Albany a couple of times, marching with signs and you know uh, on behalf of legislation or something like that. Um, but, you know, you were talking about a very small group of people, maybe 40 or 50 people at the most. Uh, and I used to go down to the firehouse, to the G Gay Activist Alliance had this firehouse downtown, and they had dances every Saturday, I think, Saturday. And I would go down there with friends and, you know, dance and have a good time. Uh, one friend of mine, who was a student at Hunter at the time, decided to do, ooh, I guess, well, he was doing some writing and some work on, you know, same-sex behavior. And so he, we decided to do some just kind of man-in-the-street interviews, if you will, man-woman-in-the-street interviews. So I, I helped him a little, with, a little bit with that. He was filming me while I was asking people what, what they thought of homosexuality. When was uh, that? Well, that had to be, let me see. Had to be 1971, I think. Pretty much 71. Yeah. And how do you remember that experience? What did, what did it feel like to ask, and what kinds of answers did you get? Actually, I was kind of surprised that I was able to do it at all because I was kind of a shy, shy type. But of course, it's easier to do things like that when you have a colleague, if you will, and he was there with his camera. Um, well. It was fun. I mean, I, I found it fun. Um, some of the reactions that you got, you know, you got you, they kind of ran the gamut. You have, you had people who would just look at you in horror and turn and walk away. You would have the people that would, you know, engage with you and talk to you honestly about it. So, uh, yeah, it, it was it was kind of an interesting interesting experience. Um, coupled with, I mean, at the same time I was working at PI, and I wasn't, I wasn't, I started dating somebody there, another person who worked in the hospital. And, you know, we were open to a couple of other people in the hospital, but not, I didn't, you know, walk onto my, my job site and say, I'm in love or anything like that. But um, there were a few people that I was close to that, you know, got the message or we talked, you know, we talked a little bit about it. Um, and the other thing about PI was, you know, of course they have a wonderful library. So, you know, for the first time in my life I was exposed to books on homosexuality. Uh, you know, some of which, um, some of which just kind of reinforced all of the old tired tired, shall we say, stereotypes and the psychoanalytic uh, interpretations and all of that kind of stuff. But then there was one which, quite by accident, I just happened to have a paperback copy right here, called this. And I... Can I read it? So when oh, it yeah. Recording. Homosexual Behavior Among Males, a Cross-Cultural and Cross-Species Investigation by Ashley Montague. No. Wainwright Churchill. By Wainwright Churchill. This is the quote <laughs> Maybe it, by Ashley Monroe. Oh, okay. By Wainwright Churchill. And so you found this at the library? I did. I, it was a hardcover. This is my own paperback. Um, but this was in the library at PI. And I started reading it. And kind of like Mary Steichen, Calderon, it was like, you know, this is, this is objective. This is scientific. This is... Uh, anthropologic, it's, you know, it, it's sociology, it's, you know, it's just, and it's interesting. And of course, I mean, you know, of course I wanted to, of course I wanted to read something that 
made me feel okay about myself because all of the other stuff that you were getting all the time was not meant to make you feel that way. So of course it felt good, good to read this. But, you know, in all fairness, I felt that it, it wasn't, um, that it, you know, it was objective and it was fact-based. It wasn't propaganda just to make somebody who was gay feel good about themselves. It was, you know, it was objective and scientific. I don't remember what year homosexual, homosexuality came out of the DSM as a mental illness, but it was very It was late. 70, well, oh, well, when you say very late, I mean, you're I talking mean, it, 72, 73 or much later. There were, dem there were demonstrations that went on during, during those early years, or during the years that I was at PI. People were showing up at the conventions, the psychiatric conferences and things, and either protesting or talking anonymously. There was one psychiatrist, apparently, who appeared uh, with a hood, uh, things like that. Uh, so, I mean, things were, things were starting to move. You know, on the one hand, you had the street activism, and um, but also, you know, I think in the scientific community too, they were starting to open up a little bit, um, and sometimes they were they were pushed by the street activists and the, and the people who would show up at conferences to do that. So, and how much did you feel that kind of tension and change while you were working there? I felt it, uh, I felt it, I, I felt that it was moving in the right direction. I felt positive about it. Um, the relationship that I was having broke up rather, uh, I was very unhappy about that and very distressed. And somebody that I, somebody that I worked with in the hospital, not with on my floor, but somebody, you know, a social worker, saw me and said, you know, you need to come talk to me. <laughs> um, you know, I did not, I did not look well, apparently, you know, and so you know, I opened up with her and talked to her. Um, and there was, a, there was, a, there was a psychiatrist who I didn't know at the time, I mean, I didn't, when I say no, I didn't know him at the time. I knew who he was. And my partner, well, my partner, the guy I was dating at the time, knew him and thought he was gay. But he wasn't out, he wasn't open, blah, 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 blah. He is out and he is open now. And is still, I guess, still a psychiatrist, although he may be retired by this time. So, th you know, things were changing, things were moving, I think, overall in a positive direction. Um, so, is there anything you want to tell me kind of about that time before we, before I ask you about Bayard? Mm. Well, I can't, nothing occurs to me offhand. I mean, we are, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be making pretty much of a five-year jump here. And so, I mean, if, you know, if I had to sum it up, I would just say, you know, I continued to, you know, I dated people, I had a couple of relationships that I thought were, you know, well, all my, all my, most of my relationships were positive, but a couple that I thought might be long-lasting that weren't. Um, but yeah, pretty much uh, just went about my business and uh, dated people, saw people, read things, and yeah. Did you go to bars? Was that part of your life? Did I go to? Oh, I did go to bars, but I only went to dance bars. I wasn't. I was not a drinker, really. I'm still not much. You know, I drink, but I don't drink every day or anything like that. Um, so I was mainly interested in going to dance bars. I, I was very interested in black men at that time, um, and there were a few bars in the city which were very friendly to interracial couples, interracial relationships. And those were the ones that I went to. Did you ever go to the trucks on the piers? No, I didn't do that. Um, the one time that I, well, the few times that I, I did go to the piers, uh, actually I was photographing a friend of mine at the piers. 
Um, so, you know, we went down there during the day when I could take pictures and do things like that. There wasn't, uh, you know, I had heard things about the piers, but there wasn't, there didn't seem to be a lot of stuff going on during the day down there. There was some, I guess, but not a lot. But I did, I did not, I myself did not go there seeking sex. I used to hang out in the Ramble in Central Park, which was, you know, a, a noted uh, or gay cruising area, if you will. Um, you know, kind of, you know, somewhat secluded, somewhat overgrown, at least at the time, up near the Belvedere Castle, uh, that area. And, you know, I, again, I was like, I was, a day, I was a day person. I was a happy, cheerful, outdoors type person. Not a dark, you know, dark, nighttime drinking, sunglasses, leather person. I was a, some, kind of a hippie in some ways. At least I sort of identified with that philosophy. Um, so I would go up there and just, you know, take a book and sit and read and, you know, sooner or later somebody would come along and would start talking and, you know, either go home together or, or not. And how long did you stay working at the Psychiatric Institute? I was there for about two and a little under three years. I left September of 72. So... Yeah, I left in September of 72 and I took another trip cross country, went out, uh, hitchhiked again across country, went out and visited my brother again. Um, came back and got a new job, new apart. well, got a new job, was living with a friend for a couple of months until I got my own place. And then, yeah. Where was that? Uh, the place? Uh, actually, up, up uh, not far from here, what is now what is now called Clinton, which at the time was known as Hell's Kitchen. Uh, got a job, uh, was there, had a job in the neighborhood, which I didn't keep for very long because I wasn't really happy at it. But then I got a job right across the street from where I lived, at uh, what was then called St. Clair's Hospital, which was actually one of the first hospitals I think which became an AIDS. Um, had a specialized unit for caring for AIDS patients, uh, which was interesting because it was a Catholic hospital. Uh, but I got a job at their nursing school as a secretary. I was, I was a very, very fast typist. So I could, you know, any job that involved typing I could pretty much get. But this was like, well, you know, I'm across the street. I can come home for lunch. I don't have to ride the subway. This is perfect. So I took that job for a couple of years. And were you taking a lot of pictures? Oh yeah, yeah, I have a lot of, a lot, well, a lot by my standards. Um, probably not by a lot of photographer standards, but, oh yeah, I was doing a lot of photography, pretty much all black and white at the time. Uh, there were rent, rental dark rooms in the city at that time, and I would, didn't have a dark room in my apartment, so I would go there and make photographic prints. And uh, Yeah, I was devoting a lot of, actually a lot of time to that, but not really... I wasn't trying to be commercial. I wasn't trying to sell my stuff. I thought of, you know, I'm doing this for my own pleasure, for my own, you know. So, yeah, I, I did do a lot of it. And I did, you know, I did do some, um, most of what I did was like architectural stuff, still lifes, landscapes. But I did start starting taking pictures of some of my friends, some of my male friends, uh, nudes, some nudes. Uh, sort of like, uh, uh, I guess, sort of, Sort of like Robert Maplethorpe before we knew who Robert Maplethorpe was, I guess you could say. Um, I didn't do a lot, you know. I didn't do a lot of that. I didn't do a lot of a lot of anything, as I said, because I wasn't devoting all of my time to that. But I, you know, I took it pretty seriously, and occasionally I would, uh, you know, I would get into group shows with uh, with individual pictures, things like that. But I wasn't interested in. I always kind of had this feeling, you know, if you. If you're making your living from your what you think is your art or your creative ability, it's you're going to have to sell out at some point or be corrupted or whatever. So I just kind of kept that as a separate part of my life. And do you still photograph? Oh yeah, I do. I do. It's mostly, of course, it's pretty much all digital now. I have, I still have a couple of film cameras, um, but you know, digital is very easy. It's very seductive, and uh, you know, not having to go to the dark room all of that kind of thing. There are a lot of very positive things about it. But I have, you know, just about all of my old negatives and occasionally I will uh, 
scan a negative, an old negative into the computer and, and work with it on the computer. Did you take a lot of pictures of Bayard? Again, a lot, yeah, but by other people's standards, no, not that many. But I, I did, I did do quite a few, yeah. Hmm? I bet they're nice. Some of them are. Yeah, yeah, they're nice. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, they get used quite a bit in um, in books and things, uh, newspaper articles, books, magazines. Um, but of course, you know, you're talking about a relatively brief period of his life. So you know, if they're looking for something from 1977 to 1987, then I have it. But Earlier things, I mean, I have those earlier things, but they're not mine. Of course. So, um, do you want to take a break for a second, or are you good? Yeah, okay. Am I moving too much, or is uh, it... No, you're good. Oh, okay. Can you tell me about meeting Bayard Rustin? Yeah. April of 1977. Uh, we were never quite sure of the exact day, but I think I kind of pinned it, narrowed it down. It was about the middle of the month. And... At the time, I was working as a temp at Rockefeller University. And I had made up my mind to leave New York, move to San Francisco. I had a friend living out there, a couple of friends actually at the time living out there. And it still had this wonderful appeal to me. So I decided I was going to move out there. And I lived, at the time, I lived at uh, 51st and, well, actually 50th and 10th. So I was, you know, over in the Hell's, Ki Hell's Kitchen area, theater district. And on my way home one day, I decided I was going to go down to a newsstand on 42nd Street and buy a San Francisco paper so that I could start looking at jobs or looking at, you know, what the market was like, what the apartment rents were like, things like that, you know, exploring. And I was on the corner of 7th Avenue and 42nd Street, Times Square, the center of the universe, I guess, in some ways, and uh, Bard was standing, you know, kind of next to you, waiting for the light. And we looked at each other, and you know, something extraordinary happened. Um, yeah, it was it was a defining moment in my life, I guess you could say. So I went on and bought the newspaper. You know, we, he, you know, he said hello and you know, introduced himself, and I went on and bought my newspaper, and then we. Uh, had a drink, got together, and you know, yeah. And you knew who he was, but did you recognize him when you saw him? I knew who he was, but I didn't recognize him exactly. No, because uh, Bard was known for carrying walking sticks, which I still have a lot of them in the apartment. And on that afternoon, he didn't have one with him. So I thought, well, that could be Mr. Rustin, but maybe it's not. But, you know, he introduced himself, so of course I knew who he was. And so, you obviously were drawn to him before you knew who he was, but when you knew who he was, what was that like for you, given you had admired him as a, as a kid in the early oh, school Oh, well, uh, it was, <laughs> it was a bit of a thrill, I, have, I admit. I mean, I, I tend to be somebody that kind of it's very easygoing, takes things in stride, doesn't get excited about too much. Um, but, you know, it was a bit of a thrill, you know, to meet, to meet somebody who I looked up to. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to, you know, he, he, was, he was a heroic person. I'm not going to say he was my hero, because I don't think I have any of those, really. But he was heroic to me. Um, and because of all of the things that we shared in terms of our interests and our values and his history, my very limited history, but his larger history, uh, you know, it was like, gee, this is a, it was a great opportunity for me to learn and um, to share, you know, to share uh, his life and to share in the day-to-day -day goings on, you know, to meet people that chances are I would never have had an opportunity to meet unless I went into that kind of work, which I guess was a possibility. But um, yeah, it was an extraordinary uh, opportunity for me and yeah, it, it was, it felt wonderful. And 
Did you know that he was Quaker? Was that one of the things you knew about him? I did know he was Quaker. Uh, that, you know, that showed up in some of the articles that appeared in the 60s when he was talking about his own history, when he was talking about civil disobedience, nonviolence, things like that. Occasionally they would mention, you know, a comma, a Quaker, comma, and go on, you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And did you, had you found a kind of a spiritual home after you left the church? No, I wouldn't say that I had found a spiritual home. I did a lot of reading on uh, of books sort of of a spiritual nature, uh, a lot of which actually, you know, were related to nonviolence because, you know, nonviolence, at least in this country, nonviolence is very often associated with Christianity, Christian nonviolence, the Sermon on the Mount. And of course, the Fellowship of Reconciliation, um, which is a group that Bard worked for in the 40s, in the early 50s. Uh, I had gotten information from them when I was struggling with the draft. And so, uh, you know, they, they would provide you with reading lists and things like that. So I was, you know, kind of reading. So, I mean, I still kind of, I guess you could say that I considered myself sort of Christian-based, but I wasn't going to any particular church. Um, Quakerism, again, Quakerism came to me uh, when I was struggling with the draft because I went for some draft counseling in Chicago and the American Friends Service Committee had an office there and, you know, I spoke to a couple of their people about my, my situation because it was, it was just unclear. Um, about my draft status at the time, because they, uh, I guess they, de they decided they were not going to give me, they, the Selective Service was not going to give me a deferment just because I was in VISTA. So I was classified as 1A. But at that point, <clears throat> were they already doing the lottery and did your number not count? Oh, no, no, no. The lottery didn't happen until the early 70s. Okay. Yeah, I was classified as 1A and, you know, we're going backwards several years now, but that's okay. I was classified as 1A. I wrote a letter to my draft board, I think in January of 1969, and sent it to them with my, with my card. Well, I thought I sent it to them with my card, but from the records that I've been able to find, I'm not even sure I knew where my card was at the time. But basically, I sent them a letter saying, you know, thanks, but no thanks. Um, and... Um, you know, I kind of spent the next couple of years, really, until the lottery happened, um, wondering, you know, when I was going to be arrested. And it didn't happen. It just didn't happen. I think by that time, I was interviewed by the FBI. I have a very small FBI file compared to Byard's. Um, but, you know, I didn't, you know, I just didn't know what was going to happen. And then later on, you know, years later after I got my file, I discovered the situation. And basically, I mean, I always thought that they didn't bother me because I wasn't out there organizing. I wasn't, you know, Rennie Davis or David Harris or any of these people being very public and leading a movement. But it turned out, according to the records, it turned out that they had just, um, they bungled it, basically. They were supposed to send me an application for conscientious objection when I first requested it, when I first uh, registered, and they didn't. And so technically speaking, I guess they were in violation of the law, and I guess it was determined that they probably wouldn't have gotten a conviction, so they just left me alone. So that's... That's really interesting. <coughs> so again, my contact with Quakers went back to uh, that period. And when you met Bayard, was he part of um, a friend's community? He was a, a member of 15th Street Meeting, but he did not go to Quaker meeting on a regular basis. Um, I don't think he sat. He, may, he, he sat on a couple of boards of organizations that were Quaker affiliated, uh, and he was you know, friendly with the then director of the American Friends Service Committee. Excuse me, a fellow named Dan Seeger, um, and occasionally would do speaking engagements for the Quakers or trainings or, you know, that kind of thing. But he wasn't going to meeting every week. Yeah. So tell 
Tell me about, about your years together. Was he still working when you met? Oh, yeah. Working? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He was. <laughs> oh, yeah. Bard worked until he died. Um, yeah, he, uh, he was running something called the A. Philip Randolph Educational Fund, uh, which was associated with something called the A. Philip Randolph Institute, which he helped to found in 1964, I believe. Uh, and basically, it was the Institute was originally founded really to kind of be a home base for Bayard. I mean, you're talking, this is a year or two after the March on Washington. He was in his early 50s. You know, he had spent his whole working life as kind of being an ad hoc freelance troublemaker, if you will, you know, hopping from organization to organization, sometimes voluntarily, sometimes not voluntarily. Um, and so the people who were close to him, the people that believed in him and supported his work kind of decided to have this little home base for him. Uh, and over time, the Institute grew into something other than that. And the Randolph Educational Fund became a nonprofit subdivision of the Institute. And Bayard kind of found himself there because because it was a 501c3, he could raise money for, for various causes and for different kinds of work. Uh, and he could draw his salary from the educational fund. So, so yeah, so he was still working. At that time, um, you know, the civil rights movement had changed tremendously in the 10 years since Dr. King had been killed, uh, but he was still very much a part of it, and at that point kind of considered a senior figure. But he had also returned to a strong interest in international affairs, international human rights, democracy, promotion of democracy, things that he had been interested in before, uh, before Montgomery, because really between the time of Montgomery and Dr. King's assassination, it was all, almost all African-American civil rights, with a, an occasional detour when he was sent into exile by the civil rights establishment. So how was he, um, how did he know A. Philip Randolph? How did, because they, they went back, um, I read, I think in 1953 when um, Bayard was kicked out of four. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm right, um, A. Philip Randolph had, had helped him get a job at the War with Sisters League mm -hmm. and had clearly been a very close colleague and I assume friend. Oh, yeah. So how, what was their history? Where did that friendship come from? I think they... They met, I think, in the late 1930s. Bayard came here in 1937 and registered at City College, did, did some work with the Work Progress Administration, WPA, as a dance instructor of all things at one time and teaching. I uh, was doing some work with the American Friend Service Committee um, and was also, you know, strongly interested, of course, in the African-American struggle. And at that time, Mr. Randolph was like the dean of activists in terms of the African-American struggle. Um, and he had his office up on 125th Street. It was the office of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. So somewhere along during that late, during that late 30s, early 40s period, uh, I don't know. It might be in some of the books, but, um, you know, Bard went to Mr. Randolph's office I think actually with one or two of his colleagues from the FOR, and you know they started started talking. Um, Bayard had become involved with the Young Communist League while he was at City College, largely because, like uh, many African Americans at the time, the Young Communist League was the only group that was really addressing, or a lot of people thought that it was the only group that was addressing the issue of racism and lynching and so the civil rights for African Americans. Uh, and so it was naturally appealing to a lot of people. Mr. Randolph had already learned that it was not all that it was cracked up to be. And he, he kind of advised Bayard to be careful and, you know, you know, see how your work goes and, you know, I think you'll, basically I think kind of said, I think you'll find that, you know, uh, their primary interest not in civil rights but in other things. And that's pretty much what happened. Uh, Bayard left there, I think, in uh, 41, I guess, or something, when um, 
when, Hit, uh, when Hitler invaded the Soviet Union, uh, the line of the party switched from you know opposing the Roosevelt's imperialist war to becoming a people's war. And the work that Byard had been doing was basically anti-draft, and particularly as relates to African Americans. And they asked him to stop doing that and support the war effort. And, you know, partly because of his, his pacifism, but I think also because he felt a sense of betrayal. He just, you know, left. And started working with Randolph, um, as well as the FOR, uh, working with Randolph on what was called the March on Washington movement. Because Mr. Randolph had proposed the March on Washington back in the 40s, one that didn't actually happen. But the threat of it, the threat of it, the organization of it, uh, forced Franklin Roosevelt's hand to sign an executive order banning discrimination in the uh, defense industries, which were, of course, a, you know, a lucrative um, place for jobs at the time, for employment. And, you know, it wasn't open to African Americans, you know, there were a lot of jobs that they could certainly do. So Mr. Rand Randolph forced Roosevelt's hand into signing that. And, the, and so the march was canceled. The purpose of the march had been to press for that, and once they got what they wanted, the march was canceled. So they were working together, really, through the 1940s. Byard went on to the staff of the FOR, um, but, you know, continued contact with Randolph, because a lot of these groups at the time, including the War Resisters League, um, the FOR, Mr. Randolph's group, certainly the ACLU, nor the Norman Thomas socialist groups, it, it was all very uh, incestuous, I guess you could say as a word, because they were all serving on each other's boards, supporting each other's causes, building coalitions. So they all kind of knew each other. So if you lost one job, you could go to work somewhere else for somebody else for a while, or you might be released from your job to go and organize for somebody else's particular campaign. So really, from the early, certainly from the early 40s until Mr. Randolph died, they were very, very close. And was he someone who consistently accepted um, Bayard for who he was, including being gay? Uh, he was. He was somebody that always accepted Bayard. Um, it's never really been very clear. Uh, Mr. It appeared that Mr. Randolph, Mr. Randolph didn't care. Okay, I know people. People went to him and talked to him about Byard, and of course, you know, Byard's record itself, including his arrest record a couple of times on, uh, you know, sexual misconduct charges or lewd vagrancy or whatever. You know, I mean, it was out there. It was in the public eye. But Mr. Randolph largely considered people's personal lives their personal lives. Um, he was he himself was a very private person. Uh, very, um, shall we say, uh, reserved, discreet, when it came to his own personal life and people's personal lives. So he just didn't, he didn't care. And, um, you know, Byard said, and this is Byard talking, not Mr. Randolph talking to me directly, uh, you know, somebody said to Mr. Randolph at one point, you know, well, you know, Byard's, you know, Byard's a homosexual, blah, blah, blah. And Mr. Randolph said something like, if Byard, if Byard, who is so intelligent and so talented and so creative, is a homosexual, perhaps we need more of them in the movement, you know, kind of period. So, you know, and he always, um, he always defended and stood up for Byard. And really, you know, if it hadn't been for Mr. Randolph, that it, possibly that attack uh, by Strom Thurmond just before the, what was the 63 March, you know, might have succeeded. I, I probably not because I think Thurmond didn't really mount it until fairly late in the game. And by that time, it was pretty, pretty hard to turn that around. But, you know, Mr. Randolph, because, you know, this had been used against Byard several times in the past, and he had been kind of sent into the desert for 40 days, if you will, you know, kind of to distance himself from Dr. King and from other people in the movement. Um, but when it came to the march, he 
you know, Mr. Randolph said. Uh, this is, you know, this is the end. You know, we're not going to have this. And, you know, I have full faith and confidence in Bayard and the leadership that's surrounding me, even though he was speaking for them. You know, we all have confidence in his abilities and his talents. And so, you know, he's not going anywhere. And that was pretty much the end of people's ability to really use Bayard's being gay against them, which is not to say that they didn't try and that it didn't come up, but it didn't have the effect that it had earlier in his, in his life. Because I was really struck by um, his importance in shaping the fundamental tenets of the civil rights movement that um, Mr. Randolph, as you is that what, what you always call him? Did you not? I was always wondering, like, did people call him Philip? Did they call oh, no. Him? It's always Mr. Randolph. <laughs> well, George Meany called him Phil. <laughs> and I think Roy Wilkins probably called him Phil. But Byard always called him Mr. Randolph. And, you know, pretty much anybody who worked for Byard or was younger than Byard called him Mr. Randolph. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Lovely. So, yeah. but I was struck by a Mr. Randolph sending Byard to uh, Montgomery and, and the role that that then played in the way that the civil rights movement played, the, the next 10 years played themselves, 12 years played themselves out. Mm -hmm. that's, that's incredible. Yeah, it was pretty remarkable. Um, pretty remarkable. And I think Byard's, you know, Byard's presence in Montgomery and the work, the work that he did there, even though it was really for a very short time on the ground, but you know, established a much broader relationship and a larger relationship um, it did. I mean, it really, you know, the work that he did there, um, coupled with the Supreme Court decision a year, almost a year later, um, which was a much larger decision than had originally been asked for. You know, originally it was the boycott. They didn't want to, they didn't want to end segregated seating on the buses. They wanted to adjust, tweak it, adjust the patterns. Um, and so, of course, the eventual result was much greater than that. And I think Byard and Mr. Randolph really saw the potential for taking what, which, what was a, essentially a local movement and a local dispute, if you will, and you know, broadening it, spreading it throughout the South, and of course, places in the North too, where segregation wasn't legal per se, but was a tradition, was a custom, was you know, de facto. Um, and so they really saw the potential there. And I think Bard's contribution, you know, he was the person that wrote the working papers which became the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. They were written by Bard. And that really became Dr. King's base during his lifetime and the basis for the movement spreading throughout the South. So he really, you know, he really did play a tremendous role in that. I, I took a screenshot of the Life magazine cover mm -hmm. it has Byard and Mr. Randolph on it, mm -hmm. which I think just think is so beautiful. And what's your, I don't know, don't you just love that? Yeah, <laughs> I do. <laughs> I have quite a few copies of it. I bet you do, better than a screenshot. Um, but I was struck by the incredible friend and ally he had in Mr. Randolph. But still the work all that you've all the work that you've done and to help um, bring him to his rightful place in history. Mm -hmm. Even though there's there was this cover like there were moments of honesty. At least that's how I read that. Um, so can you tell me what you think about that? The work that you about oh you know what it's taken to to help bring Wired kind of more to the place where he he really deserves to be in history. Sure, sure. Um, you know, I would start by saying you know I think the Life magazine cover, you know, made I mean the March, but followed by the Life magazine cover, really made a difference in Wired's profile in Byard's life. Um, it propelled him from being 
a movement person. You know, everybody in the movements, whether it was the peace movement or the, you know, the civil rights movement, you know, they all knew Bayard. But he wasn't, and still isn't actually, which is okay. I mean, you don't have to be. But he wasn't a household name, okay? Um, but after the march happened, he began to develop a profile which was more national, which was really his own. He wasn't speaking on behalf of Mr. Randolph or on behalf of a particular organization. He was speaking as Bayard Rustin. Uh, he started writing a column, which appeared in the black press, you know, weekly, bi-weekly, depending on. Um, he had the Randolph Institute as his home base. You know, started speaking nationally to different organizations. Um, working, of course, very closely, fairly closely with Dr. King, not always. Um, and he was still, of course, based up here in the North. So his profile was elevated, but it wasn't, um, and, you know, uh, it's perfectly understandable. Uh, even, even now, I, I, you know, one of the things I get when I talk to people <clears throat> And especially even young people. You know, somewhere in the Q&A, somebody in the audience will get up and kind of angrily say, how come I never, you know, this is terrible. How come I never knew about this guy? How come, you know, blah, 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 blah. And of course, if I ask them, well, do you know who Roy Wilkins is? Or do you know who A. Philip Randolph? It's like, you know, no. You know, people know, people know Dr. King, people know Malcolm X, who was not a civil rights leader, by the way. Um, so, I mean, it's really knowing history, and really that's, all, that's our own responsibility. I mean, I know Bard is being taught in some schools nowadays, and he shows up in some of the, in the textbooks, and there are actually schools named after him. Um, but it's also something you kind of have to take on yourself, um, which is what I, I mean, I did that. You know, I was interested in the movement, but I dug deeper by reading and exploring and, you know. So you don't always, and of course now with the internet and everything, it's like, you know, what's your excuse? You know, it's, it's out there. It's, I mean, I have, you know, I have 12 year old kids calling me uh, doing National History Day projects on Bard. And it's like, well, if this 12 year old kid knows about him, how come a college age, college educated kid doesn't? You know, it's not always, you know, it's not always because they were marginalized or put in the shadows. You know, that was part of it, but that's not the whole picture. It also has something to do with yourself and educating yourself. Um, so when we started the, the organization called the Bayard Rustin Fund, which is a small private foundation, very small at this point, um, because we were only set up to, be, to run for about 10 years. And this was set up shortly after Bayard died, and our intention was, you know, to get him in the history books, to publish a few things, to make the recordings available of his singing, um, you know, to in, and to get young people interested in who he was through a program where we had that we had where we placed them with organizations that worked with him. But you know, our goals were relatively modest, um, and right around the time that we were supposed to be closing down, like in the late 90s. That's when the first biography came out. And that's when I was approached by the filmmakers that made Brother Outsider. And so it kind of took, uh, Bayard kind of took on a whole new life. Uh, people started paying attention. Uh, and the other thing that ha was happening too was the LGBT rights movement was in a very different place it was than when he was alive. And they really were joining forces and honoring their quote unquote elders, if you will, uh, one of whom they considered to be Bayard. And so a lot of LGBT groups were uh, doing program related stuff to Bayard or naming themselves after him or naming a community organization or a political club or presenting awards in his name. There's an award in Boston, there's an award in Atlanta, a Bayard Rustin Breakfast they have every year. So the LGBT community was really a very strong ally in terms of lifting, lifting Bayard up and, you know, 
I'm very grateful to I'm very grateful for that, of course. And you know, I, whenever I can, we can work together on different projects and things. I, I try and do that. Uh, but they deserve a lot of credit for helping to lift lift him up. Um, the film Brother Outsider had a tremendous impact. Um, that came out in 2003, uh, the same year as John D'Amelio's biography, which is a wonderful biography. Um, but by that time, a couple of biographies had come out. Uh, a collection of Bard's, Bard's writings was, was being reissued. And, you know, that was, all to, that was great. That was all to the good. But, you know, rightly or wrongly, when you have a film that's shown on public television, you reach uh, millions of people, eventually, who are not going to sit down and read a biography of this guy. They might be compelled to do that after they see the initial thing, after the film. But, I mean, having that kind of exposure really, really, I think, turned the corner and really made a difference in terms of Bayard's visibility. And was he, because um, it was a totally different time in the gay rights movement, and, and he died just as the AIDS epidemic was really starting to hit. So was he, um, at any point in his life, kind of involved in gay rights? Was that an issue he took on, or not so much? Uh, late in his life. Um, last three or four years. He, um, he went and testified before the New York City Council on two occasions uh, for, I think it was called Intro 1 or in, in, in the second one, uh, you know, which were basically called gay rights laws at the time. You know, didn't pass. This was under, in, during the Koch administration. It didn't pass, didn't get anywhere. But he went down there and he testified. Um, and actually, I think one of the clips in Brother Outsider where he's being interviewed at the end of the film uh, that was filmed down, I think, in, in Foley Square at a demonstration down there um, on behalf of LGBT rights. And he was invited to speak to a group called the National Association of Black and White Men Together. Uh, they were having a convention in Los Angeles, I think it was 1985. And we went out there together and he spoke, um, was interviewed, uh, started showing up in some of the LGBT press and started getting invited to other groups. Some of, some of them were local chapters of the national group, others were universities, colleges, uh, LGBT groups at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, so yeah, I mean, word started getting out that he was available to talk about his life as, you know, as a gay man and as an activist. And as a, but I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call Bayard a gay rights activist. He was an, he was an activist who happened to be gay and I think he felt when he he lent him when he felt he could be useful and people asked him, he would do it. Uh, but again, this was pretty late in his life, and I think it was a time in his life when he was he was probably most comfortable with his identity. I'm not trying to imply that he wasn't always comfortable, but But he was in a stable relationship, a happy relationship. And, you know, when you've spent your life and, you know, no matter how strong you are, whether it's your racial identity or your sexual identity or whatever, and that's constantly being used as a battering ram to put you in your place or whatever, you know, it's got to have some, it's got to have some effect on your self-esteem. Um, didn't have a lot on Byards, but, you know, sometimes I think we all question, you know, maybe they're right. You know, uh, so he was in a very good place as far as his identity was concerned and his feelings about himself. So I think that also helped. Um, I think it also helped that I was working with him. Um, sometimes, sometimes the the gatekeeper, the secretary at the desk, kind of controls what gets on the boss's desk and what doesn't. I think that might have happened a few times before I got there. Um, so yeah, I think. Um, and the other thing, too, which I, I've said this before, um, you know, when you think about the LGBT rights movement when it first took off, it was, it was a street movement. It was very, quote unquote, radical. Um, it was very youth oriented. You know, Bayard at that time was uh, in his late 60s. 
Now, in his, I'm sorry, he was in his late 50s. Um, he was, I think, in the view of some people, he was not as radical as he once was. So, you know, all of those things put together, I don't think, created a, uh, a path for people to come knocking on his door. But eventually, when they did, he responded. Tell me about working with him. What, what, were, you, what were you doing mm -hmm. in those years together? Well, um, it was, uh, working directly with him was probably about the last five years of his life. Before that, I had, been, I had gone back to school. I was working at Fordham University here at Lincoln Center and going to school at night, finishing up there. And then um, I worked there for a year after I was graduated, and then went to work at Byard's office. Um, you know, doing secretarial work, administrative assistant work, that kind of thing. Uh, it was really, I think, a wonderful place to work. The people that worked there loved it. Um, it was in a very informal setting. Um, Lots of wonderful African art in his office. Not, there's a little bit here, but not so much here. But his office was mainly African art. Um, just a really, I would say, a really positive atmosphere. And, you know, at times, I think exciting. You know, you, you would pick up the phone and you weren't ever quite sure who was going to be on the other end. Uh, and, um, you know, Bard was somebody that was always very. Uh, very approachable. He didn't surround himself with a lot of formality and a lot of um, handlers, whatever you know. I mean, it was you know, it was he had come out of a he had come out of a history of you know barely making a subsistence living, you know, working as an activist, um, and that was still pretty much you know his mo, I guess you could say at at the Randolph Institute. There was never a lot of money. Uh, it was an organization that really was dependent on contributions. A lot of it from the AFL-CIO was kind of one of their subsets. Uh, the money the Bard used was mostly contributions from three or four wealthy individuals who knew him and who believed in his work. So he relied more on that money than the money from the, from the labor unions. Um, but, you know, if somebody wanted to see Bayard Reston, they could come and they could knock on the door and the secretary would tell him to sit down for a minute and she would trot back to his office and speak to him and, you know, invariably he would see them, you know. I mean, there were times when he might roll his eyes or, you know, but he, I never knew him to turn anybody away. And, you know, it wasn't about, you know, it was great if you had an appointment. But sometimes people were just coming in because they needed money, or they needed help with something, or you know they needed a lawyer, and and you know he was always there to help them with things like that. So you didn't have to work your way through a whole series of um, you know managers, execu you know junior executives, or anything like that to get to the top. He was pretty much available. You know, I worked in the labor movement for many, many years, and that was not my experience. So that's really interesting to hear. With Bayard or with anybody? No, no, with, the, with high, higher ups. Oh, yeah. There was a lot of hierarchy and, and, and control over access to the person, so it's kind oh, of yeah. really lovely to hear. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that's that's just the way he was. He was, and he didn't. His office did not have a back door, so he wanted to get he wanted to get out. He had to walk right by the person that was waiting to see him. So it was, you know, it was. Yeah, he he was always um, <clears throat> comfortable. You know, pretty much comfortable. And you know, there were times when um, there were times when it was not always comfortable. I mean, somebody who was really potentially a danger to him would come in and um, he was able to handle them be because he had been taught in the art of, uh, you know, nonviolent, uh, nonviolent action, you know, meeting people where they are, talking to them at their own level, calming them down, being open to them. So, you know, there were, you know, it didn't happen a lot, but every once in a while there would be an uncomfortable situation. And, you know, Bard was the one that handled it. 
But what would be an example? Like, what would somebody hostile be coming to see him about? Well, for one thing, um, and I'm, I'm not necessarily giving this as a concrete example, but, uh, you know, Bard was not popular in the, um, shall we say, uh, certainly not popular in the black separatist or the black power or the Afrocentrist Afro branch of the movement. You know, so occasionally they would be either burning him in effigy or publishing nasty articles about him. Um, people like uh, the man we know as Leroy Jones, well, he was Leroy Jones, um, it, it became known as Amiri Baraka, you know, would occasionally write na really nasty things about Bard. Um, you know, so one of them might show up at the office kind of thing. And, you know, they would talk. They would talk tough. But, you know, when you confronted them on it, they would generally back down. Other times it was just somebody who was clearly off there, you know, not mentally in a good place. And they might show up and they might be loud and they might be threatening and, you know. Can you tell me about, um, I know that the way that you really the only way that you could formally recognize your relationship and protect each other was for you to be adopted mm -hmm. by him. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it was 1981. Uh, we read something about uh, a couple that had tried to have an adoption in the Midwest somewhere and was denied. And Bayard thought, oh, well, this is, you know, a good idea or let's try it. Because, you know, by that time we were four or five years into our relationship. You know, we were very committed to each other. But, you know, there was a 37-year age difference between us. And despite the fact that we were kind of, you know, the AIDS crisis and everything was just was taking off, so there was no guarantee that you weren't going to die young. But if we assumed that if we lived out our natural lifespans, he would probably die before I did. And so we wanted to try and do something that would uh, protect our, our rights, both of our rights. Um, so we, ha we had a lawyer who had worked with us on, on other issues, and he kind of saw it as a challenge and decided to take it on. And, you know, we had to go through a formal uh, bureaucratic process because it's not the kind of thing that was happening every day, so they had certain rules that they had to follow. Um, a social worker came into the apartment and sat down with us and talked to us. I think. She knew exactly what was going on and the nature of the relationship, um, but nevertheless had to kind of do her due diligence, if you will. And she had to write a report, which she submitted, and uh, I guess it was whoever controls these things agreed that it, could, that it could move forward. So then it became a matter of waiting for, I guess, a judge to hear the case. And the lawyer said, you know, we have to take our time here because we want to wait till we get a judge who I think will be open to this and friendly to this. And it, it happened. I don't really, I don't think, I don't remember, I don't think we actually had to appear in court ourselves. I think our lawyer appeared and I think it was, uh, it was approved. Um, so that was that, you know, we became legally uh, father and son, if you will. Um, my mom had to give up her her parental rights to me, which at that time, at that point, I was 32 years old. It wasn't a big issue. Um, but it, prov it provided us a, it afforded us a certain amount of legal protection because when Byard went into the hospital, I was able to make decisions for him if necessary. I was able to have power of attorney, things like that. And, you know, a lot of gay couples just didn't have that kind of thing available. And it was, you know, it's, it's, hard, it's bad enough to have to deal with the illness of someone you love, but then to have somebody, perhaps who you never even met, show up at the hospital and is so, quote unquote, a blood relative, you know, give you the thumb to get out. I mean, it's just terribly painful, terribly hurtful. And so, um, you know, we managed to get around all of that. Did you celebrate when the adoption went through? Did you see that as something? Yeah, a little bit. Not a lot. I mean, we didn't have a big party. I guess we probably went out and had a nice dinner with a few friends. 
uh, and one of Bayard's friends, um, who was uh, one of Bayard's wealthy friends, who was very social and very active. You know, always, you know, a number of times during the course of the year would be invited to something that she had bought, like a couple of tables for, you know, an event, something like that. And I remember one of the, the first time after we um, that happened. We got to our table, and there was a little card that said Bayard, Bayard, Rustin, and Son, kind of thing. So you know, it was very, it was very sweet, very tender. Um, but other than that, you know, it was really, it was a legal formality. It wouldn't, have, it would be different if we were. It would have been a little bit different if we were able to have gotten married. We would have been a little more celebratory, I guess you could say. Yeah. Were you? Um, <coughs> Included and and welcomed into his world. His world, um, yeah, to a large degree. Not completely. Depends on which <laughs> which world you're talking about. Um, I would go to events. You know, he was always invited to lots of events. You know, dinners, these formal dinners and things. Different organizations would have their. <coughs> annual gathering or whatever. And yeah, we would go together. You know, sometimes we would sit together, sometimes we couldn't because he might be on the dais or something. Um, but yeah, he always, uh, you know, we were always together at these things, yeah. Uh, different people had different reactions. Nobody ever said anything. I don't remember ever any, I don't ever remember anybody saying anything that was just unkind or cruel. Uh, but you could kind of tell by the look that you got, or they just stopped, they didn't interact with you, or that kind of thing, that they were, that they were not comfortable. It was their problem. How was that for you? Um, it, felt, it felt a little bad. It felt awkward at times. But at the same time, you know, the people that I cared about are the people who I admired, who were part of that uh, group, were people that were very welcoming. You know, those were the type of people that, because of their philosophy and the work that they did, people like Mr. Randolph. You know, Mr. Randolph never said anything. I'm not even sure he ever really understood what was happening necessarily because, you know, he died actually before the adoption happened. He died in 79. Um, but I had been over to his, at that time he was living in Building 6 here. And, you know, Bard and I would go over to his apartment every so often and sit with him and talk. Um, but there were other, you know, there were other people who were just not comfortable with gay people. It's still the case, of course. So, you know, it doesn't always feel good, but, you know, you, under, you kind of understand that that's, again, their issue and their problem. I mean, we, we wouldn't have, Byard certainly wouldn't have tolerated um, would not have tolerated any, any overt bigotry or prejudice on the part of anybody. Uh, at the same time, in all, in all fairness and objectivity, you know, Bayard was, certainly in those communities, a somewhat celebrated and somewhat admired figure. So even if somebody may have had negative feelings about him or about us, they might have thought twice about expressing it. So there was a little bit of a, maybe a protective shield around him. So I was interested also in the relationship, his relationship to the labor movement, because like I said, I come out of the labor movement. And so I, of course, always knew the A. Philip Randolph Institute, because you can't work for a union and not know it. Um, oh, that's good to hear. Yeah. I mean, I know Clayola Brown. Oh, OK. Um, because I worked for Unite, and she comes out of Unite. Oh, well, Unite was, Union. yeah, uh, okay, yeah. So you know, do you know Edgar Romney? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, actually, we invited Edwin to come to the ceremony and speak. I didn't feel there was a strong enough labor presence. But, you know, since we had Norm, you know, Norm, of course, represented that. But bec both because Edgar knew Byard and because he was part of what was, or he is part of what was the ILG, it was like, well, this is a perfect marriage, but he just, for whatever reason, wasn't able to make it. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. Yeah, so, so my first job um, during graduate school was actually 
I worked for the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. So oh. I know Edgar, you know, from when I was in my 20s and it was my first job. Um, so that goes back. And were you working over here at, was it 275 um, or was it? I have worked at that building. At the, my very first job was with a, what had been a big local in the 70s. I got there in the late 80s and then it was tiny. Um, it was knit goods workers. Mm -hmm. Those people who made sweaters and they had made um, the polyester suits that were big in the 70s. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell anyone. Yeah. Um, so when were, you at, when were you with the ILG? So that was 19... I started there in January of 1990. Interesting. I worked, I worked there for a year, and then I went back to graduate school, and then I came to, back to that same local in the spring of 95, and in the summer, it merged with the Amalgamated Clothing and Textile Workers, and mm -hmm. they came Unite. Did you ever know a fellow named Neil Bisno? Does that name ring any bells? No, it does not. Okay. Well, his, his grandfather was one of, I think it was his grandfather, or his great-grandfather was one of the founders of the ILG. But the reason I know him is because one of the programs that we had with the Bayard Wrestling Fund was this fellows program where we placed people. And he, he, was one of our, he was one of our first group, which had to have been maybe the 89, 90 year. And he was placed with the ILG. So I thought maybe during that period your paths might have crossed. He's now a, he doesn't stay in touch, but he is now a fairly big um, muckety muck, I guess in the Pennsylvania labor uh, labor movement. And I guess is, I don't know, the last time I checked, he was like vice president of the local, um, I think SEIU, maybe. Well, because what was left of Unite merged into SEIU. So that would make sense. OK. Yeah, I think that's, that's where he was the last time I checked on him. That would make sense. That would be the trajectory of the shrinking of the organization. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So, so you so have I something found to... This. Oh, I have that on my wall in it's, the hallway. You, <laughs> yes. No, it's from the it, film. Uh, it's, I, it's, again, it's a screenshot from Bayard and me. Yeah. Um, and this is Jacob Potofsky. Yes, right, right next to Bayard. Or practically next yes, to Bayard. Yes, yes. I think they probably are right next to each other. Yeah. So I'm really interested in this. When was this from, roughly? Uh, 70, 71, I think, maybe 69. You can, you can find actual, up on YouTube, you can find a, some clips of the, because this was made, they were singing Let the Sun Shine In. Okay. So some of the original cast of hair is intermingled in this group. And it was for the National Urban Coalition. And um, these placards were put on subways. In fact, well, this, this was from Bard and Me. Yeah. Was this? Yeah, well, they probably, this is probably hanging on my wall. I mean, this exact frame and everything is on my wall. That's probably where they took it. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, you can see, and because it ran as a commercial on television, too. You know, it was about people coming together, people loving each other. And so uh, it was, I think it was 16, 70, 70. No, it had to be after 70, because it was when I was in New York. So it was 70, 71. Maybe seventy-two, but you could find out by going on the uh, <coughs> going on the YouTube thing. They probably have the date up there. I'll look for it. So just for the recording, it's a photo of um, I don't know fifty people of sort of from young to older, white and black, and it says love. It comes in all colors. National Urban Coalition. It's I mean besides being just lovely and it's such a beautiful picture. He looks like he's either singing or shouting in a, oh, yeah. in a rally kind of way. And Jacob Potofsky, I think, was a really interesting man. But it's also kind of because it's about interracial connection, but it kind of harkens to the gay rights movement with love coming in all colors and the rainbow. Mm -hmm. That's true, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which I know that's not what it's meant to be about. But no, and I'm sure they weren't thinking of it at the time, but certainly you're right in your, <laughs> yeah. I kind of love that. Yeah. So, um, why don't we take a break just for a minute? Okay. So I wanted to ask you a little bit more about um, 
the A. Philip Randolph Institute mm -hmm. and Bayard's relationship with the labor movement. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me sort of what that was like, given that um, the Institute itself is an AFL-CIO kind of arm, I don't know if arm is the word, but how much of a tie did he have to the labor movement and what was that like for him? Well, I think if you go, you know, if you go way back, you're talking about uh, his relationship to Mr. Randolph. And of course, that relationship, the relationship of the Brotherhood and Mr. Randolph to the larger labor movement was a challenging one at times, initially. Um, there, was a, there was a lot of racism in the labor movement. Um, and Mr. Randolph kind of squared off, I would say, with George Meaning on a number of occasions. So there was a, there was a great, I think there was a certain degree of tension. Um, on the other hand, Mr. Randolph is someone who was very intelligent, a great leadership ability, very good writer, wonderful speaker. So, um, you know, it was not, it certainly wasn't easy to write him off, if you will. Uh, and he, you know, he had come from a socialist background, if you will, maybe, I'm not even sure, maybe even a, you know, a communist socialist background. He had edited a magazine called The Messenger back in the, you, you probably know this. Um, so, Bayard, because of his relationship with Mr. Randolph, was sort of on the, always on the periphery um, of the, the, I would say, labor establishment. Now, there were progressive elements in the labor movement who were very friendly with Mr. Randolph and therefore very friendly to Bayard. So if Bayard was organizing a rally or a demonstration or something, um, which Mr. Randolph was one of the heads of, or the committee chairs or whatever, you know, Bayard's name usually didn't appear, it might appear as organizer or something like that, but we're talking about, you know, the 50s when they were organizing rallies at Madison Square Garden in support of civil rights workers or legislation or, you know, that kind of thing. Mr. Randolph would, was kind of bring the labor people in, okay? So Bayard became, I think, a familiar figure to them. Um, but the real progress, I think, happened around um, probably, and I could be wrong about this, it might have been earlier, but really around the March on Washington. Uh, Meany was still the head of the AFL-CIO. The AFL-CIO did not endorse the March on Washington, but of course some of the individual unions did. Walter Ruther was one of the big ten, I guess. Um, and of course, you had Mr. Randolph as, as the director of the march. So there was a lot of labor participation. And a fellow named Don Slayman, Donald Slayman, who I, I think at that time, I'm not positive, but I think at that time was the head of the AFL Civil Rights Department to, to the degree that they had one. I assume that they always did, but I don't know. Um, Donnie was part of the Democratic Socialist Movement, friendly with the man named Max Shackman, uh, Al Shanker, other people that were democratic socialists. Um, and I guess he got to know Bayard, and he was the one, I think he was the one that Meany called into the, to the office uh, when they were starting to organize the A. Philip Randolph Institute um, and look for sponsors, for funding, that kind of thing. Donnie, I think, was the man that called that Meany called into the office and said, you know, what do you know about this guy Rustin, blah, 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 you know. Uh, and of course he had, hold, he had already heard all the negative stuff. Uh, who didn't? Anybody who was in the know. But, uh, you know, I guess Donnie or the powers that be or maybe other labor people convinced him that this was a, a good way to go. And, um, you know, the Institute uh, became this sort of liaison between black workers and the the AFL-CIO, I guess much in the same way that I think the later on the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists, I think, 
had a similar kind of a function, although I think they considered themselves a little more radical, perhaps, or a little less establishment. Um, so yeah, so once that happened, Bayard started, you know, Bayard was invited to talk uh, at some of the AFL-CIO conventions. Um, occasionally he was kicked off of the platform. I mean, not literally the platform, but like he might have been invited to speak somewhere and then somebody came around and said, no, you can't have this guy. And sometimes that person was somebody from the labor movement. Um, I'm talking more about, I think, local people than the higher-ups. But over the years, you know, the relationship grew, and um, Bard became very close to Al Shanker, the head of the New York uh, United Federation of Teachers and later the American Federation of Teachers. Um, and they, again, they had worked together on different demonstrations, including the 63 March, but later on the Summit of Montgomery March. Uh, Al, you know, helped raise money for the, the movement, that kind of thing, uh, and took part actually in some of the marches themselves. Uh, and the, AF, the UFT had invited Dr. King to speak there, I think in 1964, delivered an address at the UFT. And they really, at that time, Byard's office was up on 130th Street, maybe 100, maybe, no, it was maybe it was 125th Street, near the Brotherhood's office. But when the teacher strikes in 68, 69 happened, Ocean Hill, Brownsville, uh, which was a struggle between so-called community control of schools versus um, the rights of teachers who were in the labor union. Um, it you know it kind of it became it became embroiled in the racial politics at the time. Um, you know there was you know some racism. There was you know sprinkling of anti-Semitism, um, and it was a struggle. Large I think a struggle largely between people at that time who were really sort of the black power militant types of the local community out there versus, again, the teachers union, which at that point was largely white, it was largely, largely Jewish, um, and there was an attitude, I think, about um, people wanting to control their own education, their own community's education, uh, which was perfectly understandable in some ways, but it became a question of how do you go about that? And I, for, for Al and the union, it was about due process and not, not someone being able to arbitrarily fire someone because for whatever reason, without due process. And this, of course, you know, was good for black workers as well as white workers, but at that time, especially for black workers, you know, and people wanted to have a hearing. Uh, about their right to a particular job or whatever had caused them to be a conflict or anything like that. They, they wanted to be able to work, work through that. But Bayard, because he took a position in support of the union, as did Mr. Randolph, was seen by some people in the community as a traitor, as a betrayer, as a, a puppet to, you know, the white, the white union leaders, um, you know, not interested in black advancement or black education. So, you know, that was, there were incidents at that time where he was threatened or he was, you know, nasty articles were written about him, that kind of thing. And I think at that point, it was decided, partly because of the atmosphere, but I think there, was, there were always financial issues too with the Institute being able to be viable. Al invited them to come down to 260 Park Avenue South, which is where the UFT was located. And that was where the Institute uh, was, I think, basically from 1969, I think, until um, they moved to Washington uh, sh not too long after Bayer died, I think maybe 1990 or something, 91. Um, and there he had, you know, I mean, he was very close to the UFT. They were very supportive of him and his work. 
I gave him a lot of, a lot of slack, a lot of leeway in terms of paying the rent and all of that kind of thing. They worked very closely together. Um, and, you know, Bayard became uh, fairly well-known and to a large degree, I think, beloved figure in some quarters in, in the labor movement. And was it your sense that in other quarters he was discriminated against or, or put aside for being gay? Oh, I think I think I think that was true in the labor movement too. You know, part of some individuals. Um, you know, kind of depending on where you are in the country. Um, in other movements, well, you know, I mean, if we're talking about the period when I knew him, um, I don't think that that was really the case. But of course, if you go back, you go back into the history and his experiences with the FOR and the so-called Christian community. Uh, they weren't really very nice to him. Uh, they didn't treat him equally or fairly as a gay man. Um, and of course, you know, you look, you have the black community. Um, there are elements of the black community that are, you know, for all of their political radicalism, they're very conservative socially. Uh, a lot of that has to do with ties to the church. Uh, especially the more conservative churches, the Baptist churches, things like that. Um, so Bard wasn't particularly welcome in those quarters, I would say. And even, you know, with, even within Dr. King's inner circle, there were there were people who were there were people who were anti Bard. Um, I think it was. A, to a large degree, I think it had more to do with his closeness to Dr. King and the fact that he was so much smarter than most of them. Um, but they could fall back on the gayness as being a way to push him, push him out, to push him aside. You know, you couldn't, you couldn't argue about Bayard's intellectual uh, um, capacity or his skills as an organizer or anything like that. So you kind of took the default position and like, you know, get that fag out of here kind of thing, you know. Um, so that, you know, that kind of thing occasionally went on. But again, later on, you know, much to a much lesser degree. But you, I mean, you still have people now. It's, it's out there. It's out there. And, uh, you know, if you look at some of the stuff that shows up in the internet on YouTube about Bayard and, you know, some of the stuff that's published, is, or not published, but videoed and put up on the, you know, it's still pretty awful. And it's not just about him, it's just about, you know, being black and being gay, and, you know, it's, and, you know, it's pretty vile. But it's also, you know, pretty easy to just kind of take it down piece by piece logically and intelligently. But, you know, when you're dealing with religion, and <laughs> when you're dealing with religion and emotion, and things like that. You're not always talking about intellect. You're talking about feelings or, you know, emotions. So. Yeah, I saw. I read that he was uh, tracked by the FBI. Oh yeah. From uh, yeah. very early on. Have you ever looked at his files? Oh yeah, I have his files. Uh, everything that I've been able to get, which is pretty extensive. Uh, although I don't have you spent any time looking at FBI files at all or anybody's uh, no, not really. Bards are actually up on the internet at least a lot of them are uh, what you find is that when you go through a lot of them a lot of them there's an awful lot of repetition so I mean I probably have 10,000 pages but you know maybe two or three thousand are worth anything there's a lot of repetition there's a lot of redacting there's a lot of pages saying this page has been removed for and there's any number of reasons why you can check so there's a lot of that. But no, he was followed, I think, from the 40s, really, early 40s. Um, and then after the march, about a year after the march, there was a, he, you know, he had a national, a national file, uh, which was largely, you know, video, you know, uh, surveillance by people on the ground. But after the march, they did a, uh, they installed a wiretap in this apartment. And so there was a whole local FBI field office file in New York, which has wiretaps of conversations with 
you know, everybody from Dr. King to his personal friends, you know. So yeah, that was, I mean, I mean these people were threatening. <laughs> what, what is it like? Being threatening our democracy, yeah. you know. Sorry, go ahead. What was it like to? What's it like to read those words? Oh, it's interesting. Sometimes it's fun. Sometimes it's boring. Sometimes it's, um, you know, in some ways it's good because for any historian, a person that's writing about Bayard, you know, it provides almost like a day-to-day -day record, at least of, you know, where he was or who he was meeting with or, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, sometimes it's wrong. Sometimes they, they'll have the names of people in there and there'll be a note handwritten on the side like, I don't know who this person is. And of course, it's like, how could you not know who that person is? You know, it's like, of course, you know, it's a very well-known person. How could you not know who the person is? You know, little things like that. And then sometimes it's humorous and sometimes it's, um, you know, pretty raunchy, pretty awful some of this stuff because Hoover was very Hoover was very much hands on, certainly in terms of Dr. King's surveillance and to a degree sometimes in Byard's. Because Byard would be invited to speak somewhere and somebody in a local community that didn't like him or didn't want him to speak would send a letter to Hoover and Hoover would write on the letter some nasty comment or respond to the person and send them a copy of Byard's arrest record, which would then show up on the windshields of the people who would come to the lecture, things like that. You know, really, just, you know, nothing about um, policy or, you know, ideals or philosophy. It was just, you know, slob, garbage. So, you know, so sometimes it's hurtful, of course. So I wanted to ask, come back to Quakerism, because you mentioned that you work for... I do. Quaker. So mm. can you tell me about... Are you a Quaker? Or? I'm not a Quaker, not officially. Um, you know, I had this kind of flirtation with them over the years. And for a number of years, I was on the, what they call the executive committee, essentially a board for the local Quaker, um, the American Friends Service Committee regional office. Um, and my official job now is I work for something called the New York Yearly Meeting which is essentially the administrative body of Quakers, um, most of New York, uh, southern Connecticut, and northern New Jersey. And, you know, it's sort of like a, it's the body that keeps all of the records and, uh, you know, calls gatherings together, has not conferences, but uh, what they call sessions, several sessions, meetings over the course of the year, to sort of determine well, to, to kind of keep the bonds between the Quaker, community, the Quaker community going, but also to determine maybe what direction the yearly meeting itself should go or what issues it should be handling. Because within the Quaker community itself, there's a, a lot of diversity, um, even within the New York yearly meeting itself, but especially across the country. As you, as you would expect, um, in the more rural sections, both of New York and elsewhere, people tend to be more conservative. So whereas you have Quakers participating in the Pride March here in New York, there's a Quaker contingent, you wouldn't find that in other parts of the country. You probably wouldn't even find a Pride March in other parts of the country, certain parts. So, I mean, there's a range. But, you know, Quakerism is a very open and a very uh, tolerant, a very uh, accepting faith. And, you know, the principles that it's based on have very much to do with how the individual perceives their own relationship to God. Um, so you don't have this hierarchy of people laying down rules and laws and commandments that you must obey. It's, it's, a very, it's I would say, very fluid in many ways. Um, Quakers are not always gay friendly. Byron experienced discrimination in the Quaker community because he was gay. Um, but they've evolved over the years. They've evolved over the years. So for a while, I was also working for the American Friends Service Committee while I was working for the New York Yearly Meeting. And then after a couple of years, I, you know, I decided I just wanted to work part-time, at least at that kind of work. So I just I left the AFSC. But um, the, a, uh, uh, the AFSC, that was in one of the organizations 
worked closely with the FOR. And during the 1940s and the 1950s, many of the speaking engagements that Bayard had across the country were sponsored or co-sponsored by the American Friends Service Committee. Um, when he was working, uh, the AFSC was one of the groups that was helping to protect the property of the Japanese Americans who had been sent to internment camps. And Bard was part of a group of people that went out to several of the camps and visited some of the people, uh, not only who were in the camps, but a couple of men who had been in prison for refusing to go to the camps. Gordon Hirabayashi, for one, uh, Bard visited him while he was in jail. Um, and the AFSC, Bard was on a speaking engagement for them in 1953 when he was arrested on a a lewd vagrancy charge out in Pasadena, which resulted in him, well, it resulted in him being expelled from the American, from the FOR. And a few years later, the American Friends Service Committee published a document, a very um, weighty, as they say in Quaker circles, document called Speak Truth to Power, which addressed the then developing arms race and Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. And Bard was part of a small, probably 12 people working group who went out to a Quaker retreat community and hashed and thrashed and developed this document which was published, which was you know, quite influential at the time. But because of his arrest record on the morals charge, his name was expunged from the publication. Now, the common law is that Bayard requested that his name be withheld because he didn't want his history to be, to distract or to interfere with the message of the document. And, you know, the more you invest, uh, people, and people, some people have written papers specifically about this whole process. And the more you investigated it, the more you realized it was a little more complicated than that. He wasn't, he didn't go so willingly. There was a lot of back and forth, uh, letters back and forth between uh, people in the Quaker community who, you know, had some influence on the outcome of the document. But the bottom line was uh, his name was, was kept off of it. Although he is often credited um, with coming up coming up with the phrase speak truth to power, which is very much in the in the common usage nowadays. Um, but in 2012, by its centennial year, the American Friends Service Committee decided to reissue Speak Truth to Power and they reissued it with a formal apology in the front of it and an explanation about this process, why this had happened, and they put Bard's name in, and they invited me down there for a ceremony, and you know, it was all very nice, and you know, it was nice, of course. So, I mean, you know, they've made progress over the years in terms of their position on, on gays and on gay rights, and I, for the most part, uh, the AFSC itself, which is Quaker-based, Quaker-founded, but not exclusively Quaker, certainly, um, is multi-faith and is much more gay-friendly than, um, you know, some of the individual Quaker communities. So anyway, yeah, so that's, um, so my connection, you know, as I was working with them for a while, I still work for the yearly meeting. I think, you know, I, I think of myself as a person of conscience, of a person of faith to a certain degree, although not necessarily tied to a, a deity. Uh, I guess maybe I'm an agnostic at this point. But, you know, Quakerism is about as close you can come to athe I guess atheism, you know, without jumping off that, uh, that cliff. So, um, you know, they're very accepting and very open. But I don't go to meeting regularly. I sometimes go to Quaker services, Quaker ceremonies and things but I don't consider myself a Quaker. So one of the things you've talked about, but we haven't called, named it this, 
is kind of Bayard's thinking about how to make change happen. Mm -hmm. So I know he wrote a piece called From Protest to Politics. Mm -hmm. And was it in varying degrees, had a, uh, this is too simple of language, but sort of more and less militant? Like you were talking about the teachers' union, like he was seen as being on the side of the more establishment protesters. As a, you know, so mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering what you think about his relationship to, the, to how you make change happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, and how you think about what's happened kind of in the struggle for gay rights. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you see his thinking and your own thinking and how it's changed over time, how it changed over time? Mm -hmm. Well, Bayard evolved. Um, and he went, he went from someone who was very radical, well, Radical, what does that mean? I would say very extreme uh, pacifist. Refused, you know, refused to uh, engage in any kind of violence, even in self-defense. Um, and someone who organized and participated in some of the very early uh, civil rights demonstrations. Individu sometimes individual actions, sometimes very small group group actions. Um, but then it got to the point, and I think in some ways Montgomery was a partly a turning point. You know, how do you go from being a small, radical, um, absolutist, if you will, group, like I think the Catholic worker still is, for the large, to you know, for the most part. Um, but then, what kind of influence do they have, honestly? Um, and Bayard was interested in influence and making change. And how do you do that without engaging with the larger community and, to a certain degree, the establishment? Um, and I think, you know, partly his own uh, evolution, his work with A. Philip Randolph, even his work with A.J., who I think I would say A.J. was still more of the absolutist type. Um, you know, he gradually evolved into, you know, is it all about me and keeping myself politically pure, or do I want to try and make real change? And how do you go about making change in a democratic society? You can do it nonviolently. You can try and do it violently, but you know, good luck with that. I mean, good luck with even doing it nonviolently. But if you can do it in a way where you can maximize your friends and minimize your enemies and build a coalition of people who may not agree with you on every single issue, you know, you're not going to get a coalition of absolute pacifists who's going to be great in any great number. But you might get a group of people who say they're opposed to the war, and maybe not for the same reasons, but they're opposed to it, or that they support uh, the right of workers to strike, or they support, you know, integrated workplaces or something. Um, and so you start, you know, you start building uh, building your base by broadening it. Uh, and I think that's something he learned, as I said, partly from his work in Montgomery, because it was the labor movement. When things started getting tough, uh, well, the labor movement, I think, was always involved to a certain degree because E.D. E. Nixon, um, Mrs. Parks' first advisor, if you will, in terms of the boycott, the person that got, him out, got her out of jail, um, was one of Mr. Randolph's Pullman porters. And as things started moving um, and they needed help with transportation and things like that, it was, I think, some of the unions in other parts of the state, uh, maybe from Birmingham, the steel workers, other people, who started carpooling and helping out that way. Um, so you had that piece of the coalition. Of course, you had always had the religious community, at least in the South, at least the black religious community, but you were able to reach out to the northern religious community, too, and challenge their, you know, challenge their... Um, 
you know, adherence to their philosophy about equality and about the brotherhood of people and all of that kind of thing, um, which is something, of course, Dr. King did in his letter from a Birmingham jail. Um, and so as by, you know, after Montgomery, Bayard started organizing larger, larger demonstrations, and that involved coalition building. So by the time they got to the March on Washington, which originally started out, it was originally supposed to be a more radical action. They were going to go in and sit in and shut down Congress. Some people were going to chain themselves to the White House fence, you know, blah, 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 blah. But then, um, well, you know, that's all well and good, but how many people are you going to get to do that? And what kind of attention are you going to get for doing that kind of action? So then when the Kennedys got wind of uh, the proposal for the march, which was something, again, Randolph had worked on, or had the idea back in the 40s, you know, 30 years earlier. And here we were at 1963, 100 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, and, you know, black people still were not free, quote-unquote free. So this was the time to go and petition the people, the people you elected, the people that supposedly we're running our democracy and, you know, get their attention and make them listen. And so a march was proposed and once the Kennedy administration introduced civil rights legislation, there became this tension between, well, we don't want to do anything that's going to interfere with that, but at the same time, if we don't do something, is that really going to go through? Is that going to really, you know, um, so there was this, I think there was this tension for several months while the march, the momentum for the march was building. And, you know, the Kennedys on the one hand saying, oh, you can't do this because it'll interfere with the legislation, and then where will we be? And of course, Mr. Randolph's longtime dream, uh, and the fact that things were starting to happen and people were coming on board. But again, the people who were coming on board were largely. <coughs> a diverse group of actors in, in different segments of the population, religious groups, unions, uh, civil rights groups, human rights groups, women's groups, all kinds of groups uh, who could coalesce around a very specific list of demands, but were not necessarily going to be arrested and torn off to jail or beaten in the streets or anything like that. And because of that, you had a demonstration that resulted in with, with real impact, you know, which really propelled the passage of the legislation and later on the Voting Rights Act. Um, and it was a, you know, it was a tremendous, uh, it was a, an uplifting experience at the end of a really terrible summer. That was the summer Medgar Evers was killed. It was the summer of the, you know, the, the fire hoses and the dogs and all of that. And, you know, I think by the end of the summer, people were pretty demoralized. And the march, I think, turned that around. Um, but again, it taught Bayard, um, you know, it moved him more into the mainstream. And some of his more radical colleagues from his earlier days felt that, you know, he was selling out. And this was a betrayal. Um, you were becoming more moderate, you were becoming more mainstream, more middle of the road. And, you know, all of the, you know, one could easily make a case for that. But again, I think Bayard saw it as an opportunity to really make a difference for the masses as opposed to remaining pure to him, <laughs> unspoiled. And I don't, I, I, don't, I don't think that Bayard, I, don't, I can't think of an incident where Bayard ever really compromised a fundamental principle of his. There would be some people who would argue with me about that, but I, I can't think of one. So I think we're going to wrap up soon. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to kind of bring this back to Stonewall. Yeah. So when you, in June, it'll be 50 years since the uprising, in June of 69. Next June, yes, of course. Right, um, yeah. in 2019. And there's the monument uh, in front of it and of, of the bar itself. So when you think about kind of 50 years and the struggle for change um, and equality in the gay rights movement, how do you think about that? And 
your path um, and the way that your path has intersected with and so much become also um, Bayard's path? Mm -hmm. Well, I never, I certainly never considered myself, well, I never considered myself to be radical. I mean, you know, depending on who you ask. Um, and I don't think of myself much as an activist. I mean, I've, you know, I've done things. I've participated in demonstrations. But, you know, that's a title. I mean, that's a kind of title I think that is assigned to you. It's not something you necessarily take on, although that's very different nowadays. Um, you know, I, f I speak out when I feel it's necessary and when I feel I have something that's either something that is important to say or something maybe that nobody else is saying that I think I can make a contribution to. So, you know, I've, you know, I've had some letters published in the New York Times, one specifically about LGBT stuff, um, things like that. Um, so, I think that the movement in a lot of ways has evolved the way that Bayard himself evolved. Uh, you know, from protests to politics. And again, there are a lot of, there's some people in the LGBT community, especially those of us who are older, uh, not necessarily me specifically in terms of this argument, but who kind of law in some ways has a, have a romantic attachment to the days when we were outsiders, when we were rebels, when we were radical, you know. Um, when there was a much more, I would say, uh, what people consider to be a distinctive gay culture, if you will, um, than there is now. Um, I, I don't happen to think that that's the case myself, because I think that um, what passed for gay culture, if you will, was really a subset of the gay community. It didn't represent everybody. It represented a certain group of gay people. Uh, because we come in all shapes and sizes and uh, political beliefs and all kinds of things and talents and everything. Um, so that particular group that stood out, I think, is, you know, certainly made an important contribution and was very visible, but we're not necessarily representative of the whole community. And I'm not sure that anybody, and certainly any one person or any one group can be. But I think what the, the lesson that the movement learned, if you will, perhaps from Bayard, not necessarily, but perhaps was that um, you need to maximize your friends and minimize your enemies. And if you're going to stay this, con you know, this marginalized, out of the mainstream kind of group, then you're not going to get the laws passed and the legislation passed and the civil rights that, that people have worked for. You need to, you need to create allies. And I think um, by going more mainstream, by forming groups like HRC and the task force, things like that, um, yeah, they're, you know, they're more mainstream, they have big budgets, they have lots of bucks, but they're also help, help make, helping to make tremendous progress. Um, so, you know, I, I, there, there's certainly something to be said for that. Um, there was a thought in my head which has kind of gone somewhere else, but... Um, you know, I, so in a way, I think, you know, they've sort of followed a trajectory a uh, that, that Bayard, Bayard followed to a certain degree. And, oh, well, yeah, one of the things he used to say because he would, you know, he'd go to campuses and go to places and um, speak to people. And, you know, they would ask him, you know, what they should do. And the first thing he would say was, you know, come out, you know? I mean, it's one thing to be this badass radical at your college campus, but you're not out to your parents. You know, it's kind of a different, uh, you know, it's a safe environment to do it there. But, you know, you really have to be open about who you are and be authentic. And I think that the fact that people have done that has largely 
changed the minds and the sentiments of a lot of people because they realized that we're not the people that they thought we were. You know, with their family, with their brothers, their sisters, their aunts, their uncles, all of those things, their friends, their teachers. So it's like, well, of course. I mean, why shouldn't these people have rights? Why shouldn't they be equal? So I think um, you know, that was one of the first things he would say to people, you know, be who you are, be authentic, which is something that he always was. I mean, that was all the way back to his Quakerism, you know, be who you are, be authentic, be truthful, be a person, speak your truth. And so um, that was one of the important lessons. And after that, you know, it kind of, can be kind of very sounding like very ordinary, mundane stuff that a lot of people don't want to do, but it's really about organizing and, and organizing about very specific things. You know, having goals, having things that you really want to achieve. You know, it's fine to go out and say end homophobia or end racism or end war, but if you don't give people steps as to how they can do that, even in a small way, then it's kind of this amorphous kind of nice kind of feeling. And I think that's part of, uh, part of the problem that we've had with some groups like Occupy Wall Street. And I don't know about Black Lives Matter. I'm not that, it, you know, that much in touch with what they're doing. And I think in, depending, it also depends on the community too. Different communities are responding on the local level, which I think is a very good thing. And that's something that Bard would support. But if you don't really have specific objectives and specific strategies and tactics is about how to get there, uh, you won't get there. And sometimes you end up being discouraged and you go home and, you know, you, you don't make progress. So I think, I think the LGBT rights movement has learned from that, from those lessons. You know, if you pick up the manuals from the March on Washington, you know, it's very, very detailed about you know, what to do, what to wear, what to bring to eat, what to, you know, all kinds of things. And a lot of people would say, oh, well, you know, is that really necessary? Well, it was necessary, you know, especially then because nothing like that had ever happened before. So you can't just, you can't just send out the word via Facebook to bring 250,000 people to Washington and, and hope that it's going to go okay if you don't have uh, organization as to getting them there, getting them to where they're going to be, getting them out, getting them food, getting them hotels, getting them bathrooms, especially back then when Washington was still largely a segregated city in 63. So you really had to be very, very careful about planning all of this. So, yeah, sorry. So uh, I'm sorry, more about... Uh, no, nothing to be sorry. Do you think it's important to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Stonewall? Absolutely. I do. I think it is important. Um, I will say that I think sometimes maybe it's romantic, romanticized a little, or and or I will say that I don't know all of my history about that. I probably need to read some of the books, Marty Duberman's book for one. Um, but I think sometimes it's a little romanticized. Um, but I kind of think of it. I think of it as the you know, I kind of think it is uh, as the Rosa Parks moment, uh, which is not to say that it was the beginning, just as Rosa Parks wasn't the beginning. You know, you had people, you had Madagine, you had Daughters of Belize, you had organizations, just as you had, you know, the NAACP and the Urban League and the FOR, you know, working and toiling in the fields and you know, working for years and years and years, trying to get legislation passed and this and that, you know, all these, you know, kind of unsexy, boring things that are necessary. And then something happens like Rosa Parks or Stonewall and things take off. So I kind of would think of it as a moment like that, you know, whereas if it had, um, if it had been quickly stopped and quelled and nothing had happened after that initial night, who would remember it? It would have just been a, you know, a riot by the Queen Bees, I think they called them in the Daily News or somewhere, you know. Um, but, it, you know, it kind of turned things around and, and became a movement. Is there anything you want to tell me, any, any story you want to 
share or thoughts before we say goodbye? Mm. Well, I can't. I wouldn't say uh, any particular stories necessarily. I mean, there are lots of stories, but nothing, of course, that immediately comes to mind. I mean, I think it's. I think it's important for people to. You know, to not give up. Uh, I think if you can learn anything from Bard's life, you know, he went through a lot. He took a lot of blows, took a lot of hits. Um, but he got up and, you know, got back in the ring. It might have taken a couple of days. It might have taken a couple of weeks. But he never picked up his marbles and went home and stopped. And he always knew. He always understood that you would never have a final victory, but that wasn't your job. I guess it's the old, uh, the old, I guess Hebrew maxim, or you know, you know, yours is, is not your job to finish the task, but to never lay it down. And that was. I think that was that was what sustained him. Uh, there were other activists, um, some in the gay community, who did pick up their marbles and go home, or went and formed alternative communities, uh, left the mainstream, whatever. But Bayard just wouldn't do that. He would not give up. And so, you know, if it's an inspiration to people, his tenacity, his stubbornness, his whatever, uh, I think that's probably the most important. Uh, important lesson that we could learn from his life. So. What do you want people to say about you? Me? <laughs> um, I don't, that I tried to be a good person, that I tried to be a kind person, I tried to be a loving person. Um, you know, I did some some good things in helping uh, raise awareness about who Bayard was, and more importantly, about the values that he stood for, about the idea of, of building community and building brotherhood and building, using nonviolence to do that. I think that's more, even more important than Bayard's name. Um, so I would want to, I, I would like people to think that, you know, I was useful in that sense. But that's pretty much it, I think. <laughs> yeah. Remember me kindly, perhaps. That's probably the best I could hope for. That's lovely. Should we say goodbye? Sure. Goodbye. <laughs>